In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome to this program, Learning to Live in God's Divine Will. Let us address the importance of Mary's role in these end times during these tumultuous months of restrictions on account of a virus, and that has generated some discontent, concern among many of us. Whenever we're faced with trials, we must always turn to Christ through Mary, and therefore must look at Mary. It can be gleaned from the writings of the servant of God, Luisa Picareta, that the gift God wishes to give us through Mary and through Louisa of living in the divine will was not actualized in the wounded human nature of the baptized before Louisa. This is found in various passages of her writings. And even though this gift was not actualized in the baptized before it was imparted to the church through Louisa, the Blessed Virgin Mary assists in its actualization through Jesus' timeless humanity. You see, all the souls of all time were redeemed by Christ's timeless merits. Otherwise put, although Christ was conceived in time 2,000 years ago, the merits of his thoughts, words, actions that impacted and divinized human nature were retroactive, influencing the patriarchs and prophets and judges of the Old Testament. They were concurrent with his present generation, and they were proactive, impacting all future souls as well. Therefore, when this gift is being imparted to us from God through the Blessed Virgin Mary and Louisa, it is by virtue of Christ's timeless humanity. But Mary, more than any other creature, mediates through her Son the divine acts he accomplished and that she accomplished and the gift of living in the divine will to all creatures. Take, for example, volume 23, December 1st, 1927. Jesus reveals, The Holy Queen received everything from my will. The fullness of grace, of sanctity, of sovereignty over everything, and even the fruition that gives life to her Son. My will communicated to her everything and denied her nothing. My daughter, all the acts that my Holy Queen Mother accomplished in my will are awaiting their actualization. They await the retinue of each soul's acts to have yet to be accomplished in my will. So these are the acts that come to your aid whenever you accomplish your acts in my will. Furthermore, each of Mary's acts lines itself up around you to give itself to you. Some give you light, others grace, some sanctity, and yet others the very act that you wish to accomplish, so as to actualize in you the retinue of these noble, holy, and divine acts. These acts are the outpouring of God, who administering them to the soul enables it to be so filled with them that it is unable to contain them. In this way, the soul pours them out anew and offers its divine acts to its creator. There is no blessing that does not descend through these acts accomplished in my divine will. The heavenly sovereign woman awaits the actualization of the retinue of her acts so as to move God to make us make our supreme will come to reign on earth. So here the Lord is stating that Mary's acts that come from God and that she accomplished in her humanity through the eternal power and will of God await 
each soul's acts. Because Mary wants to impart to our acts the merit of her acts, and Jesus the merit of his acts. And these acts of Jesus and Mary come to our aid whenever we accomplish our acts in his will. And each of Mary's acts line themselves up to give themselves to us. And these acts give us light, grace, sanctity, and assist us in the very acts we accomplish so that Mary and Jesus' acts may be actualized in us. And these acts are the outpouring of God who wishes to fill our soul with them. Now why do Jesus and Mary wish to communicate their acts to our acts? Because they empower our acts. They enable our acts to become divine, divinized, and eternal. Consider analogously a child wishing to learn how to swing a baseball bat or ride a bicycle or drive a car. Now let's take a bicycle, for example. The child does not know how to balance the bicycle initially, so the father or the mother will hold the bars or sit behind the child and enable the child to balance the bike and pedal at the same time. Well, that is a small intimation of the acts of the parent empowering the acts of the child, magnified a millionfold, are the divine acts of God's divine will operating in our finite acts in an invisible, immaterial manner. We don't see them, we don't touch them, but they are more real than those acts we see and touch. These acts occur within the will of the soul of the human being, with the consent and cooperation of the soul's intellect and memory, and will, of course. So we must invite God to operate within us with his own divine acts. And this synergetic operation, that is the operation of God in man, which is a theandric operation, transforms the soul into another Christ and establishes within it a triune indwelling whereby the Father operates in the will. The Son operates in the intellect and the Spirit operates in the memory. And this operation, although spiritual, extends itself to the body where the Father beats in the human heart. The soul consents to the sun's movement in its lifeblood and to the spirit's motion in its breath. Now, this synergetic operation, so to speak, is also alluded to in the writings of St. Maximilian Kolbe. St. Maximilian Kolbe foretold a period when the Blessed Virgin Mary in the end times would come to the aid of the human race. I wish to pull this quote up for you so that you get a better understanding of the role Mary's playing in these end times for us. Axonium Colby states, The Holy Spirit is Mary's spirit. Far from being alienated in her personality because of the dominance of the Holy Spirit, she is on the contrary more than any other creature in full possession of herself. She lives in a state of divine synergy with the Holy Spirit. And in presenting the future church as a holy and immaculate bride for Christ, St. Paul 
uses the Greek word immaculate, immaculatus in Latin, and attributes it to the Blessed Virgin Mary as if to designate Mary as the prototype of the future church. Now, the servant of God, Luisa Picareta, picks up this theme as well. Oh, by the way, with respect to the Blessed Virgin Mary being the prototype of the future church in its holiness, this is also taught by the Second Vatican Council document, Lumen Gentium, Article 63. It states, the Blessed Virgin is a type of the church in the order of faith, charity, and perfect union with Christ. And the Catholic Catechism, Article 972, along with Lumen Gentium 68, states, they state, the mother of Jesus is the image and the beginning of the church as it is perfected in the world to come. Now, the servant of God, Luisa Picareta, talks about the importance of Mary's mediation in these end times as well. See, Mary, more than any other creature, mediates through her Son the divine acts of God's divine will to us. And by virtue of her fiat, voluntas tua, your will be done, billions and billions of acts of grace communicated themselves to souls and continue to do so. This is found in volume 12, February 2nd, 1921. But back to the fiat voluntas tua of Mary. We read on January 17th, 1921, Jesus relates, Creation came out from my fiat. Therefore, in each created thing, one can see the mark of the fiat. Redemption came out of the fiat mihi of my dear mother, pronounced in my will in carrying the same power of my creator fiat. Therefore, there is nothing in redemption which does not contain the mark of the fiat mihi of my mother. Now, fiat mihi in Latin means, be it done to me. My pains, my wounds, my thorns, my cross, and my blood had the mark of her fiat mihi, because things bear the mark of their origin. My origin in time was the fiat mihi of the Immaculate Mother. Therefore, all of my works bear the mark of her fiat mihi. So her fiat mihi is in each sacramental host. If man rises again from sin, if the newborn is baptized, if heaven opens to receive souls, it bears the fiat mihi of my mother that places its mark upon everything, follows everything, and from it everything proceeds. So, this is the importance of Mary's role, not only in the work of redemption, but on sanctification. And this brings us to Mary's cooperation with the Holy Spirit in these end times. Mary occupies a singular role in these end times in the work of the Holy Spirit. To present to Christ the Immaculate Church, the bridegroom without spot, stain, or wrinkle for the nuptials of the Lamb at the wedding feast. Now, when we hear of the Holy Spirit, we oftentimes hear of the word parousia, which is a Greek word whose English equivalent denotes presence, coming, or return, a new Pentecost, a new outpouring. And the teachings of the Magisterium define this word parousia as the return of Christ as judge of the living and the dead at the end of the world, but remember, Christ's return at the end of the world may in part explain why the fathers of the church refrain from using the word parousia when referring to the era of peace, this intermediate coming of Christ. When the church fathers speak of a Sabbath rest, an era of peace, they are not speaking of the end of the world, the final coming of Christ in the flesh, but rather an invisible interior reign of Christ in the will of man. 
and they accentuate the Holy Spirit's transforming power at work in the sacraments that perfect the church, as well as through the gifts of the Spirit, like the gift of living in the divine will that Louisa Picaretta speaks about, so that Christ may present the church to himself as an immaculate bride upon his final return. So several church fathers and early ecclesiastical writers describe an era of peace as a coming of the Spirit of Jesus, otherwise known as a pneumatic coming, but interior, invisible. Jesus tells Louisa in, on February 8, 1921, My daughter, the creature always raises more into evil. How many mechanizations of ruin they are preparing. They will go so far as to exhaust themselves in evil, but while they occupy themselves in going their own way, I will occupy myself with the completion of the fulfillment of my fiat voluntas tua. Your will be done, so that my will may reign on earth, but in an all new manner. I will occupy myself to prepare the era of the third fiat, in which my love will be demonstrated in a marvelous and unheard of manner. Ah, yes, I want to confound man in love. Therefore be attentive. I want you with me to prepare this era of celestial and divine love, and we shall work together. He tells her also on May 2nd, 1923, when my fiat voluntas tua has its fulfillment on earth as in heaven, then the second part of the Our Father prayer will be fulfilled. That is, give us this day our daily bread. And that bread is the will of God. As Jesus said in the Gospel, my bread is due to do the will of my Heavenly Father. On May 17th, 1925, Jesus reveals, the divine persons always being united in their works. The Father creates, the Son redeems, the Spirit sanctifies, and the fiat voluntas tua will be attributed to the Holy Spirit. It is precisely in the fiat voluntas tua where the work of the Holy Spirit will overflow. Now, as you well know, wherever there is God in this work of redemption, in this theater of redemption, in this wounded environment of earth, between original sin and the final returning of Christ in the flesh, there is always Satan trying to undo the work of God. And the greatest nemesis of Satan is the Blessed Virgin Mary, the spouse of the Holy Spirit. Since Satan is bent on aping God's plan of salvation, one of the many weapons he employs in its destruction is the woman. Statistics show that there are far more cases of diabolical possession with women than with men. The reason? Satan seeks to counter the first announcement of salvation, the Proto-Evangelium, which is found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, which states, I will put enmity between you and the woman, meaning between Satan and Mary, between your offspring and hers. He will strike at your head while you will strike at his heel. Now, Pope John Paul II, who is now saint, states that Mary, the woman, is assigned the first place in the first announcement of salvation, the Proto-Evangelium. She is the progenitrix of him who will be the redeemer of man. And in view of Mary and her future triumph, Satan becomes enraged. He knows, because God announced in Genesis 3.15 that Mary will defeat him, and seeks to avenge himself upon all women, because Mary is a woman. The late exorcist of Rome, with whom I worked for several years, and actually who reared me, trained me, mentored me in exorcisms, Father Gabriel Amorth of the Archdiocese of Rome, made the following statement. It is above all women who are stricken by the demonic because 
they are more easily exposed than men to the danger of the demonic. He states, I have encountered numerous cases of women who because of demonic possession were forced to prostitute themselves. For this reason they have no moral blame. The women preyed upon by Satan are especially those who are young and of pleasing appearance. During some exorcisms, the demon with a terrifying voice has roared that he seeks to enter women rather than men in order to take revenge on Mary because she has been humiliated, he has been humiliated by her, unquote. So if Satan targets woman, it is because Mary, the ark that bore the Redeemer, possesses an efficacious power that far exceeds that of other creatures, and is who is holier than all other creatures combined, and who will defeat Satan. That Mary is the woman who transcends all other human beings combined in holiness is found in Luisa Picaretta's writings. I'll give you two examples. Volume 19, May 31st, 1926. Example number one. Here Jesus states, Mary's smallest acts done in the unity of the light of my will were superior to the greatest acts and to all the acts of all souls combined. Let me repeat that. Mary's smallest acts, that would be like sweeping the floor, picking up something, done in the unity of the light of my will were superior to the greatest acts and all the acts of all souls combined. That includes all the acts of martyrs, of the apostles, of the Cenobites, of the anchorites, of the monks, of the nuns. Imagine that. And Jesus adds, this is why when compared to the acts of the Holy Queen, the sacrifices, works, and love of all other souls can be called little flames before the sun or little drops of water before the sea. And this is also found in volume 17, May 1st, 1925. And it's also found... I'll share one more quotation that I'm pulling up here with you. For with, I'll share with you. It's found um, on November 20th, 1938, volume 36. It's quite a lengthy passage. But um, I'll find a shorter one, actually, for you that I can share with you now. And this one comes from, here it is, May 1st, 1925, where Jesus tells Louisa, in addition to me, there is my heavenly mother, who received the unique mission of being the mother of the Son of God, and the office of co-redemptrix of mankind. On account of the mission of her divine motherhood, she was enriched with so much grace that all other creatures combined, both in heaven and on earth, will never be able to match her. But this was not enough to draw down the word into her maternal womb. It was necessary that she embrace all creatures by loving them, making reparation for them and adoring the supreme majesty on their behalf. By this means, she alone accomplished in herself everything that all human generations should offer to God. As she conceived me, she took on the office of co-redemptrix and shared and embraced together with me all the pains, reparations, maternal love on behalf of all. In the heart of my mother, there was a fiber of maternal love for each soul. And this is why in truth and justice, when I was on the cross, I declared her the mother of all. 
So Mary occupies a very powerful role in these end times, and because she is going to be the one to bring about the era of peace with the Holy Spirit, as she is the spouse of the Spirit, Satan seeks to attack her through other women, because he's humiliated by her who is a woman. But even though Satan targets women more than men because of this, she, the woman, the new Eve, and mother of the church in the new order of grace, will communicate to her children and other women the graces God imparts to her. As the ark that bore the divine redeemer, Mary participated in the mission of redemption more than anyone else. Because she gave birth to the sustenance, or she gave birth, I should say, to the divine substance of God. Certainly God preceded Mary, he's eternal, but she gave birth to him in time, and that divine substance she gave birth to in time. Satan's contempt for her is unbounded. Satan did all in his power to dissuade her from carrying out the plan of redemption beside her divine son. This is why he forced her to make an arduous journey to Egypt, to experience rejection at an inn in her time of expectancy, to receive into her arms the lifeless body of her son and endure many years of solitude and separation from the one who gave life its meaning. Satan caused Mary immense sufferings in order to dissuade her, from standing by the cross of redemption and from carrying out her role as co-redemptrix. The Catholic Catechism states in Article 946, Mary's role in the church is inseparable from her union with Christ and flows directly from it. This union of the mother and the son in the work of salvation is made manifest from the time of Christ's virginal conception up to his death. And in Article 968, the Catechism states, in a holy and singular way, Mary cooperated in the Savior's work of restoring supernatural life of souls. That makes her a co-redemptrix. She participated in a holy and singular way in the Savior's work of restoring the supernatural life of souls. Yet, Satan's plans were permitted and even used by God for mankind's sanctification and salvation because God knows how to convert even evil to good, like original sin, that brought about the incarnation, passion, and death and resurrection of Christ. Having been spectator to Mary's unwavering fidelity to the will of God in the work of redemption, and realizing that his plans against the woman prophesied in Genesis had failed, Satan, what did he do? He then sought to obtain what satisfaction he could by snatching souls from God through other women. And this, in this way, the exorcist of Rome affirms that Satan used a certain woman, that is, until the woman, Mary, and her seed will crush his head. So if Satan has marked woman more than men, God has done so even more for his universal plan of redemption. If the majority of prophets of the Old Testament were men, from the 12th century onward, proclaiming the prophetic word of God became more and more a female privilege. God raised up many women to whom he communicated direct prophetic revelations with innumerable messages for the church. Among these prophets who occupied a very active role in, this, in the society of their time, I mention just a few here, like Saints Bridget of Sweden, Catherine of Siena, the servant of God, Luisa Picaretta, the um, ser servant of God, Martha Robin, Maria Valtorta, and others. Julian of Norwich. And these lived secluded lives, most, many of them, compelled by chronic illness. Faustina Kowalska, another one. 
and the writings of these women became known through the activities of their priest confessors. And through the interest of ordinary believers whose lives have been changed by their writings. Many of these prophets shared in the spirituality of the early Christian martyrs, for they considered their sufferings a participation in the salvific passion mission of Christ. God chose these spiritual female giants to help the woman, Mary, and her offspring crush the head of the serpent. They cooperated in Jesus' work of redemption with Mary, who generated and formed them to do battle against the infernal spirit, and she is forming us today in these end times. Since Mary's maternity came by the power of the Holy Spirit that overshadowed her for the purpose of generating and forming the Son of God, the Church bestows upon her the title Mother of the Church to illustrate the continuity of her mission of generating and forming other sons and daughters of God. St. Louis de Montfort reaffirms this prerogative of Mary, Mother of the Church, when he says that she will consequently produce the marvels which will be seen in the latter times. The formation and education of the great saints who will come at the end of the world are reserved to her. And he states, Toward the end of the world, Almighty God and his Holy Mother are to raise up great saints who will surpass in holiness most other saints, as much as the cedars of Lebanon tower over little shrubs. In the second coming of Jesus Christ, Mary must be known and openly revealed by the Holy Spirit, so that Jesus may be known and loved and served through her. Now, St. Maximilian Kolbe adds that the image of the Immaculata, the Virgin Mary, will one day replace the large red star over the Kremlin. So we know that from these prophecies of saints, Mary not only occupies a singular role in these end times of forming and preparing her offspring to crush with her the head of Satan, who in these end times is trying to undo the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit. by giving us the gift of living in the divine will, but we are also, through Mary and the Holy Spirit, being prepared for battle with the weapons of the rosary in our hands, the sacraments at our disposal, the indulgences of the church to avail ourselves of, and the brown scapular to ensure eternal salvation to our souls, and the miraculous medal to provide us with spiritual protection and grace and other sacramentals we have at our disposal. So the Holy Spirit is not only with Mary forming and preparing us for battle in these end times, but he's giving us the greatest gift of all, the gift of living in the divine will to do battle against evil and to enable the gift of God's will to reign on earth as in heaven and hasten its reign. Let me pause here and remind you, listeners, to continue to support Radio Maria, this broadcast. That depends upon your prayers and gratuity. It's a listener-supported program, commercial-free. So continue to be generous because it's the gift that keeps on giving. You give to Radio Maria and we, in exchange, give to you sound Christian theology and teachings relevant to these times in which we live. So I shared with you a few passages of the servant of God, Louisa, in regard to Mary and her importance and her lofty role. The woman who surpasses all other saints combined in holiness and whose acts overshadow that of all other saints combined. And this role of Mary in these end times is extremely important because she is the mediatrix, not just the co-redemptrix, of the gift of living in the divine will. She's not only the mediatrix of grace, 
but she is the mediatrix of the gift of living in the divine will. Now, in her role of mediation, Mary reminds us, or Jesus reminds us, that we must turn to Mary in order to obtain this gift. And this is important teaching that I began to share with you at the beginning when I spoke of billions and billions of acts of grace communicating themselves from Mary to souls. And again, that passage is from volume 12, February 2nd, 1921. The divine will that Mary possessed from her immaculate conception generates, even before the creation of Adam, in a timeless manner, the light and life of grace and Jesus himself within all souls. See, because Mary acquired the fullness of grace, the fullness of the seed of the divine fruition, she was able to generate in her womb the eternal Son of God and convey to all creatures all the blessings she possessed. This is found in volume 28, November 22, 1927. Jesus reveals the Holy Queen was able to generate the eternal word without anyone's aid. Apart, of course, from the Holy Spirit. He means any creature's aid. By not giving life to her human will, she gave life to the divine will alone. And in this way, she acquired the fullness of the seed of divine fruition and was able to generate him whom heaven and earth could not contain. And not only could she generate him within herself, within her maternal womb, but she could generate him within all souls. How noble and long is the generation of children of the heavenly queen. She generated everyone in the divine fiat that can do anything and that encloses everything. What all others together were not able to obtain, she obtained. The Holy Queen had conquered first within herself, her creator, and the fullness of all the blessings that she implored for others. And being the conqueror, she had the virtue of being able to implore and impart the blessings that she possessed. Jesus reveals a similar teaching in volume 19 on March 31st, 1926. It behooves you to know that my heavenly mother was able to conceive me the eternal word within her most pure womb because she possessed the will of God on earth in the same way that God possesses it in heaven. All of the prerogatives that she possessed, virginity, conception without original sin, sanctity, seas of grace, were not enough to conceive a God, as all these prerogatives gave her neither the immensity nor the all-encompassing vision to be able to conceive a God who was immense and who sees everything. In short, without the supreme will, she would have lacked the seed of divine fruition. But by possessing the supreme will as her own life, and by possessing the will of God in the same way that God possesses it, she received the divine fruition, and with it the immensity and the all-encompassing vision to conceive God. That is why in a natural way I could be conceived in her. So, Mary, who acquired this divine fruition, is able to engender within us the fullness of the blessings of God that she possessed. In fact, nothing good exists that does not come from Mary's acts in God's will. This is found in volume 12, January 17, 1921. And why is this? Because everything that Mary, po Mary possesses and engenders comes from God. She contains the fullness of grace. Every grace that God ever wants to give, Mary contains and wishes to mediate to us. But we have to be disposed by asking for it and disposing ourselves to receive it by being in the grace of God. And we, her children, await the actualization of the retinue of her acts in our souls, whom she disposes 
so as to call down from heaven to earth the reign of the divine will. Jesus tells Louisa in volume 22, June 1st, 1927, as the soul disposes itself and repents, Mary herself gives the soul the proper disposition for repentance. Mary bilocates her Jesus, the fruit of her womb, and gives him completely to each soul, unquote. And this is also found in volume 35, May 28, 1937, the same teaching. Mary disposes us as we dispose ourselves and repent. Once we have an act of contrition in our heart and invoke God, Mary then helps dispose us for this very repentance we are trying to utter. And she bilocates Jesus within us. Because Jesus finds in Mary his own redemptive acts that enclose all the acts of the kingdom of the divine will, she is referred to also oftentimes in Louisa's volumes as his echo. And therefore he discovers her in the steps, thoughts, words of all of his children. So Jesus gave Mary the office of co-redemptrix and mediatrix because she is the one through whom we are redeemed, with whom we are redeemed, and through whom we receive the gift of the divine will, and with whom we receive the gift of the divine will. And Mary helps actualize God's grace and gifts by enclosing and embracing all souls and all creation within the eternal operation of God's one prime act. Jesus tells Louisa in volume 13 on April 16th, 1926, my mother received everything from us, the Trinity, in order to diffuse herself in everything and to place herself above every soul's act, above every act of love, above every step, every word, every thought, above every created thing. She placed her prime act upon all things, which gave her the right of queenship over everyone and everything. She surpassed in sanctity and love and in grace all the saints who have been and will be and all angels combined. Unquote. This is how great Mary is. And this is why we refer to her, apart from any other saint, as worthy of hyperdulia. You see, when we pray to the saints, it's called dulia in Latin, which is reverence. And when we pray to God, we call it latria, which is worship. But when we pray to Mary, we don't call it dulia or latria, we we call it hyperdulia. Extreme reverence, more than reverence given to any other saint, because of the magnanimous sanctity of her soul as well as her body. It is God's all-embracing prime act that she possesses that enables her to bilocate Jesus in each soul. And she possesses this one eternal prime act of God more than any creature. And in bilocating God in each soul, she's communicating to each soul all of Jesus' acts, all of her acts. And she casts God's light of grace, which are referred to in Louisa's volumes as sons, spiritual sons. She casts God's light of grace throughout heaven, purgatory, and earth, and makes reparation to God and adores the supreme majesty on behalf of all, thereby accomplishing in herself all that mankind should have accomplished for God. Let me share with you one passage in this regard taken from volume 6, December 21st, 1903. Mary reveals here in this passage that seven spiritual sons were produced by her seven sorrows. She reveals, See, these seven sons which come out from my immaculate heart are my seven sorrows that produced in me so much glory and splendor Now let me pause there. 
Where did these sorrows come from? Who produced them? Satan, as I mentioned before. He forced her to flee to Egypt. He forced her to... No, no, when I say forced her, I don't mean he violated her will. He, through sin and through his evil minions in the world, compelled Mary to flee to Egypt because Herod wanted to kill her son. That caused her sorrow. That's one of the seven sorrows, by the way. Also, she had to see him be circumcised. The law of sin produced this cut of circumcision and also receive his lifeless body in her arms and the other sorrows. So you see how God used evil that produced in Mary these sorrows and converted them to her own betterment, her own glory and splendor. So Mary says, these seven sons which came out from my heart are my seven sorrows that produced in me so much glory and splendor. These sons, the fruits of my sorrows, continuously pierced the throne of the Most Holy Trinity, who, feeling wounded, send me seven channels of grace continuously, making me their owner. And I distribute them, hence mediatrix, I distribute them for the glory of all of heaven, for the relief of the poor souls in purgatory, and for the benefit of the pilgrim souls on earth. And she's doing this more now today than ever in the history of human civilization, because in these end times, the greatest gifts are being outpoured, despite the greatest outpouring of evil. And it is God's prime act at work in Mary that makes her so great because she possesses this prime act more than any other creature. And Mary, the Corridemprix, Mediatrix, is our mother. And she will indeed crush the infernal serpent's head. But not alone, but with her offspring who are us. And God chose among the offspring one to be a second mediatrix of the gift of living in the divine will. Whereby we have three. We have Jesus. He's the first mediator between God and man. Mary is the mediatrix whose holiness no creature will ever surpass. And now we have a third. A second virgin that God called to the aid of the human race. The servant of God, Luisa Picaretta. She is the third mediatrix of this gift of living in the divine will. As Mary received the unique office of co-redemptrix and mediatrix, who is the repository of the acts of all souls in the fiat of redemption, so Luisa receives the unique office of heralding in the gift of living in the divine will, and she also becomes the repository which Jesus refers to in Italian as depositaria, depositaria, which is repository of all the acts in God's fiat of sanctification. In, in fact, God imparted to Louisa new prodigies of grace never done before that would accompany her in her cooperation with the Holy Spirit also. in the work of actualizing in the redeemed the gift of living in the divine will. By virtue of Louisa having centralized and conceived Jesus in her acts, like Mary, and having multiplied Jesus' life within herself, like Mary, God entrusted her with the office of sanctifying all creatures with the sanctifier of the Holy Spirit. Take, for example, this passage from volume 23, January 27, 1928. Since all the acts of the kingdom of my divine will are enclosed in the acts of my redemption, I have from that time called you, Louisa. And as I deposited in the Holy Queen of Heaven, Mary, everything that regarded the kingdom of redemption, so will I deposit in you, Louisa, everything that regards the kingdom of the supreme fiat of sanctification. This is why I want you to follow me step by step. And as a little child, I weep, desiring you near me to give you the gift of my tears, with which I implored for you the great gift of my divine kingdom. 
Now, Andy, I'll conclude with this final passage taken from volume 16, August 13th, 1923. My daughter, my eternal wisdom disposed that one heavenly creature, the holiest of all, Mary, should prepare the seed of my holy and supreme will in which I would carry out the divine design of man's resurrection. Now, through another creature, you, Louisa, I cause her complete interior to resurrect in the eternal son of my will and to actualize the plane of my operation in all human generations so that whoever wishes to enter may do so by placing themselves in rapport with the will of their creator. So here you have it. Mary was called by God to be the co-redemptrix and mediatrix of all grace, the formator and disposer of all souls in these end times. Louis, and she was also called to prepare the seed of the holy and divine will of God. And then he called Louisa, in addition to Mary, to actualize the seed that Mary prepared in all human creatures. And Mary cooperates with Louisa, and Louisa cooperates with Mary in actualizing the seed in us. So we have a triple mediatrix plane here, Jesus, Mary, and Louisa. So whenever we receive the gift of living in the divine will, we must be aware that it comes to us by way of these three spiritual giants. One giant is God himself in the person of Jesus Christ. The other is the Blessed Virgin Mary to whom we render reverence like we do with no other creature. It's called hyperdulia. And then comes Louisa, who was conceived in sin like us, who actualizes with the Holy Spirit this gift. Mary with the Holy Spirit prepares the seed of this gift, and it is Louisa with the Holy Spirit who actualizes this gift in all human nature. But it is up to us individually to welcome this gift from these three spiritual giants. And if we do so, we will, with Mary, form that white army of light, rising up to fight the good fight, so that with God we may experience, even on earth, heavenly delight, and crush the infernal serpent's head. May God bless you and keep you in his most holy will, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>